Genesis chapter 13. And we're going to read from verse 5 all the way down to verse 12. Genesis 13, 5 through 12. Genesis 13, 5 through 12. And the Bible reads, And Lot also went, which went with Abraham had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that they could, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzites dwelt then in the land. And Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of the Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the gardens of the Lord, garden of the Lord in the land of Egypt, like the land of Egypt, as thou camest unto Zoar. And Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and, let, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. With the help of the Lord, I'd like to preach on this thought. Beware where you pitch your tent. Beware where you pitch your tent. Let us lift our hands and work in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns on high, that there's none like you, Lord. Now, Lord, I pray that you anoint my mind and my lips to bring forth your words, Lord, today. And anoint our hearts and our minds to receive your message with gladness. May it take root in our minds, Lord, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, may it take root in our hearts, that we may be transformed in your very image, Lord, and that it would follow us the rest of our lives. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we look at this passage here, there's something going on. Abraham has brought his, lot, his son, his nephew Lot, with him. And they are on their journey, and the Lord has prospered Abraham. And sometimes when we prosper, those around us begin to prosper as well. Not because of who we are, but because of God's hand upon our life. And we see that in the case, as is the case with Lot. As Abraham, God blessed Abraham, God blessed Lot. And their herds grew so large that their herdsmen began borrowing, saying that this land is ours and that you need to go somewhere else, or we were here first. But something happens in this passage, we see. Abraham tells Lot, you know what? We need to do something. We need to come up with a solution. We need to go our separate ways, that our herdsmen may not borrow. Let there be no strife between your house and my house, but may we be at peace once again. And to ensure that, you go one direction, and I'll go the other direction. That way there's plenty of space. This land is big enough for both of us. We don't have to reside in one spot, but you choose which portion you want, and I'll take whatever's left over. And we see here, something begins happening with Lot. Uh, he goes, all right. And almost we almost see the flesh taking over with Lot. You know what? That land over there. There's a lot of vegetation over there. You know that land over there? There's a lot of water that comes along with it. My, I need to make sure that my cattle is well taken care of. So we see Lot's eye getting involved. And he tells Abraham, I will take this land over here because it looks good. You know that sometimes the best things in life are not those things that look good. That's how we begin getting involved with the world. Sometimes our eye catches things. And he says, you know what? I'm just going to dwell over there a little bit. 
Why don't I get over there a little bit? It seems to be a little bit greener over there. The pasture seems to be a little bit greener on that side of the fence, Brother John. What we don't realize at the time is the reason the grass looks greener on the other side is because somebody just came through and painted it green. It's not natural green, but it just looks good to the eye. You know, that's how we begin getting entangled with the things of the world. No, oh, it looks good over there. Things just seem to be going so difficult for me right now. You know what? I'm just going to move a little bit that way. Pastures seem a little bit greener. And our eye gets involved. And what happens when our eye gets involved? If we look in the case of law, we find he not only goes to where it's greener, he doesn't only go where the water seems to be more plenteous. But the Bible doesn't say that Lot pitched his tent toward the green pastures. The, Lot doesn't, the Bible doesn't say that Lot pitched his tent towards the most abundant watering hole. But there was some other reason, perhaps, that Lot chose that side of the country. Because the Bible says Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. Lot pitched his tent to the world. You know, when your eyes get off the things of God, when your eyes get off holy things, and they think that I need to go after what's over there, that looks better over there. It's not long before we start pitching our tent towards the whole reason we're gazing over there in the first place. The only reason we're not gazing over there is because things look a little bit easier at the time. Our heart's drawn to something. What's your heart drawn to today? Where are you pitching your tent? Lot pitched his tent for Sodom. And we can go through this passage time and time again. And we can say, well, Lot didn't go into Sodom. No, not initially. Well, Lot didn't say that to Abraham. He was going to go into Sodom. No, not initially. But something caught his eye. And when the world catches our eye, we're already in a downhill slope. We're already going towards things that we shouldn't be. And before long, our heart says, you know what? I know why I'm pitching in this side of the country. I know why I'm on this side of the world. And we begin focusing on what our heart desires is. You know, our heart is deceitfully wicked. And who can know it? And we need to be careful where we pitch our tent. You can say, well, Lot didn't eventually go there. Well, yes, Lot eventually did go to Sodom. Why? Because that was his heart's cry. But did good things come out of Sodom? No. We know that Sodom was exceedingly wicked. And we would read down in verse 13, the Bible says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Not sometimes, but exceedingly. And they were just wicked towards the Lord just a little bit. But exceedingly. Oh, where's your heart at this morning? Where is your tent pitched toward? You might be saying, well, I'm not sitting like that. No, not yet you're not. But if you keep going the path and down the path you're going, it's not going to take long. And if it doesn't take long, you're only going to stay there longer. You know, sin not only takes us deeper than we ever wanted to go, but it keeps us for far longer than we ever dreamed or imagined. Where are you pitching your tent this morning? He's going to say, well, well, you know, I'm not doing it for that reason. I'm sure Lot had good intentions. Yes, his intentions might have been good. He wanted to make sure everything was nourished and everything was watered and everything was fed. But that wasn't the primary desire for pitching that way for the Bible said that he pitched his tent towards Sodom. He had a destination in mind. He had a goal in mind. And it wasn't holy and it wasn't worthy of what God would make worthy do him. It's not something God will look down and say, you know that is something that is pleasing to me. But Brother Justin, the Bible says that God, even though he was in Sodom, he vexed his righteous soul daily. Yes, he might have vexed his righteous soul daily, but how long did it take Lot to get right with God again? Did his heart ever change for God in the first place? Did he get caught in the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? Did he get caught in the lasciviousness? Did he get tied up in their greed and their lust? We don't know. The Bible does not record. But we also don't know if he was always righteous before God either once he was there. Yes, he might have vexed his righteous soul daily, but once he was there, I told you already this morning that sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go, and it will keep you 
longer than you wanted to go. Oh, you might think it's something you can play with now, but those chains, they get bigger, and they get heavier, and they weigh down on you, and they get burdensome, and they get tiresome. And I'm telling you right now, if you keep going towards God, you're going to find that you're in a location that you never wanted to be in in the first place. You're going to find that you're in a situation that you should have never been in the first place. And all because you pitch your tank towards Sodom. And you think this thing is going to keep just you? No. The devil doesn't come to play games, but he comes to take as many with him as possible. He's not going to just take you, but he'll take your spouse, and he'll take your children, he'll take your grandchildren. When we look at the story and it's kind of lie here, we find that Sodom didn't just take um, Lot captain, but it took his wife, it took his children, it took his grandchildren. He went there, and you told you know what? Where the you know where the angels found Lot? They found him still dwelling in Sodom. That man, that man had best his righteous soul. Yes, it did. But how long did it take for him to realize that I should have never pitched my tent for Sodom? I should have never made those desires in my heart. I should have never followed through with them. I should have never should have made those, those decisions. I knew it was wrong at the time, but I did it anyhow. I knew I never should have pitched my tent for Sodom, but you know what I did? And now I found myself living in Sodom, and maybe my wife doesn't want to go. My children don't want to go. My grandchildren don't want to go. Why? Because of sin that I played with has entangled me for a while. And even though I broke through, it got a hold of my wife. It got a hold of my children. And now I just can't leave this place. And I am the only Jesus that they're going to see in this marble land. But if I never would have pitched my tent towards Sodom, we wouldn't be here in the first place. And it all started because I looked over and I saw that it was good. Sin will take you deeper than you ever wanted to go. Sin will keep you longer than you ever wanted to go. But it's not just going to keep you. That moment when you say, Lord, I need you to forgive me of this sin. Jesus might break those chains. But I'm telling you right now that that sin is going to follow you for generation after generation after generation. If you follow through with it. Lord tried to get out of Sodom. Those angels tried to pull his family with you. But his sons, his daughters, they didn't follow with. He got two daughters that lived at home. That was all that followed him. His wife came with, but we know what happened. For some reason, she got distracted. She got her eyes off the way of the, G of the Savior, and she looked back. <coughs> that sin that, uh, that Lot started with, that look in that gaze, it looked good at first. But now when Lot is traveling through, he hears fire in the distance. He smells sulfur in the distance. He hears the hail coming down, pummeling buildings and covering them all up. Why? Because one man followed after the lust of his heart and the lust of his eye, and he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And now he is paying the consequences. I'm telling you this morning, if you do not follow Jesus with your whole heart, you're going to end up not only out of the will of God, but it is going to affect those around you, and it's going to affect them possibly for generations to come. All because what you thought was good, and you followed after the desires of your heart. And the outcome is not the best. Oh, it's not going to be anything like it should have. When Lot was coming out from Sodom there, his wife looked back. And as a memorial, she turned into a pillar of salt. It was such a memorable occasion. It was such a lesson that the Jews never forgot. How do we know this? Because in the New Testament, all Jesus had to say was, remember Lot's wife. He didn't have to go through the account of what happened. He didn't have to tell him that it all began with one man looking over and seeing the world and saying, you know what, that looks good. Jesus didn't say it began when he locked his tent towards Sodom. He didn't have to say any of that. All he had to say was, remember Lot's wife. <clears throat> Why? Because the Jews knew immediately the situation that happens when you get your eyes off the Savior. If you lose sight of what God has for you, 
you may just become a memorable marker. And not a good one. But Lot's wife didn't want to leave Sodom. Whatever it was, and we can go through, the Bible doesn't list the reason she looked back. Was her heart still there? Did she look back because she remembered that she had children and grandchildren back there? Did she hear the cry of a child and say, you know what? My children are back there. My grandchildren are back there. And for one moment, she loses her eyes off of Jesus and looks back. Or was her heart completely back there in the first place? She only followed along because she knew destruction was coming. The Bible does not say. But what God does say is, remember lost way. Because where one man pitched his tent towards, it affected his family and his children for generations. And if that's not enough, Yes, Lot's two daughters followed with him. But Lot lost his entire family. A family that began with a patriarch that knew God. A family that began when Abram was brought out of Ur of the Chaldeans, whose father was an idol maker. They worshiped other gods. But the man that said, you know what? I only want there to be one God in my life, and I will follow. That man that trained up his family, that offered up sacrifices for him, that acted in the place of the high priest, his own nephew departed. And that side of the family became enemies of God. Why? Because one man looked at something and said, you know what, that looks good to me. And as his eyes got farther, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And when he pitched his tent for Sodom, it just escalated. And when we get to the end of his life, Lot loses his wife. He loses those family members that were left behind. And all that comes with him are his two daughters. But these daughters are not good daughters. But rather they trick him and they go into them, and Lot fathers two children, one to each, the Moabites and the Edomites. And because one man pitched his tent toward Sodom, he lost his entire family. <coughs> But Brother Justin, it affects his righteous soul in the first place every day, but he never should have been there in the first place. He was called to be out of the world, just like the church is called to be out of the world. But yet there is too much of the world in the church. There are too many people coming to church that are dabbling with the world, that are pitching their tents towards the world. And if they're not careful, they're going to end up in the world. And it's not going to just affect them, but it's going to affect their entire family for generations to come. Because one man pitched his tent towards Sodom. He lost his wife, who became a memorable account to go back for the Jews. Not something you want to be known for. He lost his family that refused to leave Sodom. And the only two daughters that came with him birthed children to him that would become future enemies of Israel from that point to the end of time. Where is your tent pitched this morning? Is it pitched toward heaven or is it pitched toward the world? Where are your desires at? Are they pitched towards heaven or are they pitched towards the world? Where have you pitched your tent this morning? That is the question. As Sister Sandy comes to the piano, we need to make sure that we are following God with everything that is within us. Because it's going to affect us and our entire family. What did God tell us about Joshua? I know that he will instruct his family in my ways. I know that he will teach them to follow my ways. I know that he will teach them what is right. No, it's not just our souls that are on the line this morning. 
It's the souls of our children, <coughs> our grandchildren, our spouses. But where have we pitched our tent? Today we're going to take some introspection. Say, Lord, check my heart. The Bible says that no man can know his heart, for he is deceitfully wicked. But there is one that knows your heart, knows my heart, knows your heart, knows the heart of every individual in this place, knows the heart of every individual outside of this place, and is calling from the throne room of heaven. Follow after me. Come out from amongst the world and be separate. And follow after me. The church is never meant to be mixed in with the things of the world. It was always meant to be separate. We go back to the Israelites. They were never meant to be in the world. They were constantly meant to be completely separate. Abraham, when things got rough, went down to Egypt. Why? Because things look better down there. And <coughs> sin, we see Paul in after his own descendants. Things get rough. Where does Isaac go? Down into Egypt. Even just for a time. They were never meant to be in Egypt. Joseph is second in command. All of Israel packs up and goes to Egypt. But they were never meant to be there in the first place. God positioned Joseph where he needed to be for the time. But all of Israel was never meant to be there. And later, God has to bring them out by his mighty works. Where are you dwelling at today? Where is your tent pitched? Is it pitched towards heaven? Or is it pitched towards the world? Is there some sin that's over there that we think is good for the time being? All oh, grass looks greener over there. Well, yeah, it looks greener. It's painted over there. It's not natural. The devil's trying to lure us in. Because if you can lure us in a little bit at a time, those chains will get heavier and heavier and heavier. Until it's to a point it feels like we don't know what else to do. We're bogged down. And we're going to die in this place unless God does it. <coughs> But let us not be ignorant, for that sin that may overtake us is going to affect everybody else around us, too. And it'll last for generations and generations and generations. Israel came out from Egypt. Moses, God's man, goes out into the mountain. He's receiving the oracle of God. He's receiving the law and the instruction. And Israel goes, you know what? It was better if we would have stayed back in the world. We're out here. It's hot. It's dry. And where is Moses? For all we know, he's dead up there. And they say, you know what? We should go back to Egypt. They look back. And after they look back, they begin thinking, you know what? What's God doing for us? Let's build us a golden calf. What are they doing? They're turning to their sin. I don't worship what did Israel suffer with time and time again throughout the entire Old Testament? <coughs> Idol worship. They go back to the old gods of the world. They go back serving their old sin. Where are you at this morning? Where have you pitched your tent? Is it towards God or is it towards the world? As everyone stands across this auditorium with every head bowed and every eye closed, let us check our hearts. God revealed to us our hearts this very morning. Let us not be deceived by the enemy, but let us not be deceiving ourselves either. Let us not think that we can play with sin, but yet we can come back to you whenever we want. Let us not think that it's all right to pitch our tent towards the world as long as we're not doing the things of the world. Let us not be deceived. Because Lord, you know the desires of our heart. Lord, may we come back to you and make a real commitment to you this very morning. Lord, I'm not going to let the enemy take my life. I'm not going to hand over my soul. And Lord, I'm not willing to bring others along with us. I'm not willing to bring my family. I'm not willing to bring my children. Lord, I'm not willing to bring my grandchildren. 
Lord, you said in your word that the sin of idolatry, because of that, that curse shall be upon their children and their grandchildren to the third generation. Lord, I don't want sin to follow me, but let the curse be broken right here and now. If that's the desire of your heart, why don't we find ourselves a place around this corner today? Oh, no, 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 no,